Hey guys, welcome back. We are in uh, chapter six of LPAP Kogo today. Uh, chapter six introduces us to democratic regimes. Okay, so let's start with the term democracy. That seems like a great place to start. In defining democracy, we go back to the origins of the word, okay? In the original Greek, demos refers to the common people, and kratia means power or, or rule. Uh, so taken literally, democracy is a system in which political power resides with the people. So in the modern era, democracy takes all kinds of forms, but all democracies have a few core things in common. These regimes all include public participation, political co competition, and liberty, which we're going to define as limits on power, okay? Uh, as they're all core features of democracy in the modern age. Many non-democratic countries, such as Russia, uh, Iran, they have elections, okay? But they would not be considered true democracies because they certain elements of participation uh, competition, uh, liberty, they're fundamentally broken, okay? So these systems are sometimes referred to as illiberal, uh, sometimes referred to as hybrid. Uh, these, these are, they're not true democracies, and they are discussed more in Chapter 8 when we get to non-democratic regimes. You can hear my puppy upstairs going crazy uh, just after dinner. He just had a, a, a big dinner. He's playing with his, his toys now, and he's going to probably do this through the whole video, so we're going to get used to that. So liberal democracies, on the other hand, um, different than non-democratic regimes or illiberal or hybrid regimes, um, liberal democracies are going to be... A they are political systems that promote participation, they promote competition, and they promote liberty, and they emphasize individual rights and individual freedoms. Okay, when looking at democracy on a timeline, we start in ancient Greece with Athens. Okay? Athens was a small community of direct democracy. From there, bigger populations needed to transform into indirect democracies. Um, they couldn't have this direct democracy because you just couldn't have everybody represent themselves. You wouldn't get anything done. So we had an indirect democracy. So one sub-variant of indirect democracy comes from Rome, the Roman Republic, is republicanism, which emphasizes separation of powers um, within a state and the representation of the public through elected officials. Sounds familiar, right? United States of America. So let's let's make sure that we're making these connections. Rather than evolving in a direct line from ancient Greece, democratic governments have risen and fallen over the centuries. The modern era of democracy begins with the United Kingdom's slow transition to democracy. Uh, this evolution begins with the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. By limiting this power, um, the power of um, the king, the monarch, um, they ensured certain rights to the aristocracy. It laid the groundwork, however, for limited government, due process before the law, and legislative rule. So as states evolve into democracies, we want to look at why is this happening. So some possible explanations for dem democratization include modernization, elites, civil society, international relations, and public culture. Again, we're going to, I'm going to repeat these, but we're going to go through each of them uh, a little bit briefly in just a second. Modernization, elites, civil society, international relations, and political culture. Modernization scholars emphasize that the societal tr transformations that coincide with economic modernization lead a country's population to put more pressure on the government to reform and to adopt liberal democratic governance. So the, the economy, the spurring of the world is connected through our economy is what's going to push this, is what modernization scholars are going to say. So many current democracies are listed among the world's wealthiest countries. Uh, many wealthy countries such as the United States, United Kingdom, Germany are, are democratic. Okay. However, this theory falls apart quickly and it's fallen out of favor since the 1970s, mostly due to empirical evidence. What's empirical? You guys got this normative empirical. You, you can do this, right? Uh, India is a, great, a good example of a democracy that emerged 
prior to modernization. They were, their economy hadn't caught up, but they had a democracy before then. Other countries, um, China most recently, have shown that modernization is possible without democratization. A second argument for uh, democratization is the elite or the ruling class. Elites are, um, they're not just the country's formal leaders. They uh, also include the wealthy individuals who benefit from a non-democratic regime and help to fund it. If they see, though, that they will be better off or just as better off under a democracy, they're going to support that change, right? If they're not going to be, they're not going to support that change. A third argument is the civil society. Civil society is the organized life outside of state control. In other words, civil society refers to the organizations that are not part of the state. Okay? These may include, for example, bowling clubs, uh, religious institutions, labor unions, other kinds of community organizations. Non-democratic governments are aware of the risks of emerging civil societies. The world watched as civil society groups led to the end of communism at the end of the 1980s. And again in the 2010s, the early 2010s, as protests emerged in the Arab world. Non-democratic leaders sometimes take an active role trying to limit or capture civil society as a way of preventing such challenges to their authority. Our country that we're going to look at again, China. China, for instance, limits the activities of uh, environmental or religious groups, even when they are not explicitly political, to keep civil societies from rising up. A fourth explanation is outside influence, um, international relations. Uh, the impact of international actors depends on a number of factors. Uh, includes how, uh, how connected a country is to the outside world, basically. International actors have little influence on North Korea, for example, because North Korea has this internal isol isolation. They are kind of their own unit. They don't depend on the rest of the world. China has such big size, um, their e economic resources are so large that they can limit the effectiveness of international uh, actors, however. But we look at some other places in the world where they depend, maybe for tourism, if it's a small island, uh, they depend on tourism, and so they have to evolve with the rest of the world, and that is maybe causing their democratization. A final explanation is political culture. Many people used to argue that uh, democracy required Western values to function properly. Uh, while you often hear ar this argument in uh, the press or uh, Western politicians maybe use it or using this, uh, many modern political scientists are, are uncomfortable with these arguments. Democracy has spread to many countries around the world and each major global region has at least one democracy now. Most political scientists today argue uh, that there are no democratic or undemocratic uh, cultures, that instead culture shapes the form of democracy. A country decides to adopt when it uh, makes this transition. Japan and South Korea, for example, they are great examples of non-Western democracies. While dem democracies vary greatly in what form these institutions take and how much power they have, all liberal democracies progress, uh, they possess, sorry, not progress, they possess three branches of government. They possess an executive branch, a legislative branch, a judicial branch. Sounds familiar, right? Start making these connections. United States has an executive, a legislative, a judicial branch. The executive branch of government carries out the laws and policies of the state. There are two distinct roles, and we've got to make sure that we know them because some countries are going to combine them, some are going to separate them. So we make sure that we know these. There are two distinct roles in the executive branch. There's the head of state and the head of government. The head of state is uh, symbolic. It's an embodiment of the people. Um, and sometimes they conduct uh, international affairs. They have a lot less power. They're symbolic. The head of government, however, runs the state and leads the government. The head of government also makes national policies and directs officers and ministers. The executive is going to vary between countries. Countries can combine or divide, like I said, the head of state and the head of government roles. Constitutional mar monarchies such as um, the United Kingdom, uh, Sweden, Norway, ne the Netherlands, they have a monarch who plays a largely symbolic role non-political role. Think of the United Kingdom with Queen Elizabeth. 
that would, she would be the head of state. And as a parliamentary system, Germany may have a president, but that role is, again, largely symbolic. The chancellor um, is currently Angela Merkel, and she has a lot of the head of government duties. The United States has a presidential system, meaning the president um, holds both positions. South Africa is a parliamentary system where the executive is elected by the legislator, but not the people. Uh, but their president also serves both of these roles. So it's different from country to country to country, whatever their constitution sets up. But they all have an executive branch, head of state, head of government. The legislative branch of government that is the one that makes the laws, okay? Uh, legislators can be unicameral, which is um, common in smaller, uh, homogenous countries. Legislatures uh, can also be bicameral, which is normally the case in larger, uh, more diverse countries. In bicameral legislatures, houses may be elected using different rules, uh, often related to federalism. Uh, fun fact, historically there have been tricameral and even tetracameral legislatures, uh, but there are none, none, none like that today. Um, but they were often separated, the, each chamber was separated by socioeconomic status, uh, and therefore um, the, maybe the, the poor or maybe the, uh, a race or, or et cetera would each have their own representation in the government. Legislatures may be chosen by a direct election, indirect election, appointment, uh, heredity, several ways, um, just like the executive, we, they can set things up any way they want to. Legislatures, they can set that up however they choose to in their, each country as well. Members of parliament are chosen in a number of different ways in the different democracies. Uh, in France, senators are chosen by grand electors. Don't you want to be a grand elector? That sounds fun, doesn't it? Um, themselves mainly elected officials. Uh, in Germany, members of the Bundestag are appointed by state governments. In the United Kingdom, lords are hereditary, uh, with some appointed directly by the government. Several attempts at reforming the lords to make the chamber elected have been made, but none, so, none have been so, uh, successful so far. Sometimes uh, states may decide how their parliaments are, are selected. For example, the United States Senate was originally comprised of appointments by state government. Uh, it was only in 1913 with the adoption of the 17th Amendment. My U.S. AP Gov kids are going to yell at me if I don't get that. It's 17th. 17th Amendment um, that U.S. voters are now allowed to directly elect their senators. Our final branch is the judiciary, uh, the courts. Uh, they maintain the rule of law. The rule of law is defined in our book as individuals and groups, including those in government. That's the important one. Circle that, highlight that, asterisk, whatever you got to do to make that stand up. But um, including those in government are subject to law, irresponsive of their power, order, authority. So here's the law, no matter who you are. Okay. In democracies, courts interpret application of laws in criminal and civil suits and normally have a hierarchy so that the losers in a case can usually appeal to a higher court. Think district court, appellate court, Supreme Court in the United States. Legal traditions vary greatly between countries. Within countries, different legal codes apply to criminal cases and civil cases. As a result, judges and courts are forced to specialize. All states follow a hierarchy of courts. Uh, and usually a disputant who loses a case in a lower, case, lower court can move up to the next uh, and the next and the next to appeal their rulings. Which court is highest, however, may vary between countries. Some countries may have a high, their highest court be their constitutional court, um, the, um, while others have um, separate courts for these issues. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court is an example of a constitutional court and an appellate court. They... they um, have the final say on appeals. They also have the final say on any constitutional questions. In many other countries, um, Germany, France, uh, South Korea, these are two separate courts, one for appeals, one for constitutional questions. Uh, so one for reviewing legislation, that's a constitution court, and one for handling appeals. I think I was mistreated in the court below me. 
Let's talk a little bit more about uh, constitutional courts. 90% of democracies have a constitutional court who have judicial review. Now, let's think back, Marbury versus Madison, for all you L LPAP golf kids out there, Marbury Madison. But judicial review is the power to decide whether laws and policies violate the constitution of that country. There are two types of judicial review. Okay, there's abstract and concrete. Abstract reviews uh, mean that political leaders can, can contact the, the court and say, can you tell us if this is constitutional or not? So they're maybe passing a law and they said, before we get the, this all passed, is this legal, is this not? That would be abstract, before it is a law. Concrete review uh, means that citizens use court cases to challenge a law after it's been passed. So Congress passes a law signed by the president, and then a citizen says, I don't think that this, ha this, this is good, uh, and it's going to challenge it in the courts, and the Supreme Court will have the final say that way in concrete review. The way that branches of government relate to one another also differs depending on the system of government. In parliamentary systems, the legislative and the executive branches are fused together. In presidential systems, there's a separation of powers between executive, legislative, and still uh, the judicial system. And then a third system, the semi-presidential system, is a hybrid system with two executives. Uh, lucky for us, we get to study all of them in this course. Let's take a minute and uh, compare these systems. A prime minister is much easier to replace than a president. A president serves for fixed terms, four to six uh, year ter presidential terms are commonly, are common four to six year terms, not four to six presidential terms, four to six year terms are common for most democracies. Uh, and they can only be removed from office under extreme conditions. In the United States, for instance, uh, impeachment requires the House of Representatives to indict, to impeach, and then uh, the Senate has to have a, a court um, and then the Senate has to vote two-thirds of the members to, to uh, remove the person from office. Never happened in the United States history, okay? Becomes difficult. In contrast, a prime minister can be replaced by another member of their party at any time. Uh, in the United Kingdom, for instance, half of all prime ministers in the last century, uh, so last 100 years, half of the prime ministers were replaced without even holding a general election. Okay, they can be replaced by other members of their party. So um, very, very different uh, systems here. In addition, a parliamentary system may have um, more fluid election cycles. Unlike a presidential system, which um, barring something weird happening, only holds an election at the end of the mandated term length. Uh, parliamentary systems may hold an election if the parliament passes a vote of no confidence or if the prime minister calls for new elections. So if the prime minister says, let's vote, United Kingdom goes out and votes. If the parliament says, we don't like the prime minister, let's get rid of them, we have a vote of no confidence, let's go vote. They don't have to wait for an election cycle to come up. They can vote at any time. In parliamentary systems, the executive and the legislative branches are fused. We said this earlier. What that means is the prime minister is both head of government and a member of the legislature, okay? Prime ministers are sometimes referred to as the first among equals, uh, capturing the idea that they may lead the parliament, but they are ultimately beholden to that institution and its members because that member, came, that prime minister came from the, uh, the, uh, the parliament, okay? All right, now in a semi-presidential system, the voters elect both the president and the parliament. Following the election, the president then appoints a prime minister. Uh, who must then receive a majority of the votes of the parliament. Um, this dual executive system creates a prime minister who is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the government, but whose loyalty is split between the president and the parliament, because he's got to keep both of them happy in order to maintain that position. In some semi-presidential systems, the president dominates the political system. The prime minister is treated as a junior partner. Uh, even the legislature is considered a secondary institution. Uh, many former Soviet states, including Russia, operate under this system. In other countries, in contrast, the prime minister enjoys more independence from uh, presidential directives, and the parliament initiates most laws. Uh, Lithuania, uh, breaking out of that post-Soviet um, presidential dictatorship system, uh, has an active parliament and a much weaker president. 
uh, in Finland, uh, not that far from there, responsibilities are divided so that the president concentrates on foreign policy and the prime minister on domestic issues. Again, we can see from state to state to state, things are going to be a little bit different based on how they decide to run their governments. Another democratic institution is political parties. Another democratic institution are political parties. Is political parties? Let me know in the comments. If democracy is government through competition, participation, and liberty, like we said earlier, then political parties help assure that two of those features are operating effectively. Political parties mobilize voters, recruit new political leadership, which increases participation by helping citizens into the political system. During elections, they articulate an ideology and present policy goals, thereby offering voters a choice between different candidates and promoting competition. Once in government, political parties help organize factions in the parliament and other branches, helping to ease the policymaking process. And finally, when these governments, government governing parties seek re-election, voters can decide whether to reward or to punish for them for their actions. So um, by either voting them back into power or by stripping them that power and voting somebody else in. While no modern democracy can exist or has existed without political parties, not all democracies have the same uh, type or party systems. Uh, some homogenous countries such as um, South Africa, such as Japan, which we've talked about a little bit already, uh, have largely dominated by one party through their history. Um, in the United States and uh, the United Kingdom, there are two major parties here uh, war that are trying to get control of the government. And if we look at um, Germany, if we look at uh, the Netherlands, we have a multi-party system. We have several, several different parties that are vying for power. Uh, and so they have to um, come together as coalitions in order to um, get the government to, to work right or the way that they, they hope it will work right. Um, what sort of par system, um, what sort of party system a country has is shaped by a number of factors, including that country's electoral system. In the United States, that electoral college really limits how many parties can get involved, and so it really kind of maintains that two-party system. When we compare the world's democracies, you can see there are a lot of different ways for votes to be transformed into seats in Parliament. Uh, these varying systems can be organized into a few big categories. Uh, we can compare these categories by the, who, who the voter is selecting, uh, candidates or political parties, uh, by how the representatives are chosen by, from each constituent, constituency. Uh, do they give us electoral districts, um, district magnitude? Uh, and by the vote calculation used to determine the winner. So let's take a look a little bit at what we mean by this. Let's first look at single member district systems, and that's kind of what we're gonna see in the United States. An SMD, single member district, uh, often abbreviated SMD system, means that people in a district select one representative to represent them in a larger body, usually a legislative body. In this system, voters will select a candidate from a pool of other candidates, and they can have only one winner. The way the winner is chosen can vary, though. Uh, some states use a plurality system, which means the, it's also called the uh, first past the post. So if you see that in the reading, first past the post is the plurality system. Basically, you get the most votes, you win. Okay? Other states use a majority system, which means that if you don't get 50% of the vote, you cannot win. And so what they'll do is maybe they'll take the top two or three people, if we had like 10 people running, uh, the top two or three people and make, let them have a runoff uh, and see who wins now um, until we get a majority uh, vote. And so um, even within uh, the single member districts, there's different ways to, to select our leaders. Well, you probably guessed if there's a single member district that there's also a multi-member district, and you're absolutely right. Multi-member districts, MMDs, uh, use a proportional representative mo representation model. Uh, here, voters are going to select parties rather than candidates. So it would be like the equivalent of going to the poll and selecting uh, Republican or Democrat. Okay, we're gonna select a party, and the amount of representatives for each constituent is normally two or more. 
uh, as the number, the name, you know, multi-member, we're going to have multiple, so two or more. And the party who receives the seats um, based on the percentage of the proportion of the votes they receive. So if uh, our district maybe get, is allotted 10 um, uh, representatives, then if it was a 60-40 vote for Republicans and Democrats, 60, we would have six Republicans and four Democrats representing our district. Uh, still other states are gonna use a mixed system. Uh, in a mixed system, voters are gonna probably vote for a candidate and they're going to, again, vote for a party, okay? And the candidate will uh, represent the constituents, but the party will also select representatives based on proportion again. Uh, with a small modification to electoral rules, a majoritarian or a plurality system can become a form of preferential voting. Voters still elect candidates, but instead of voting for one, they rank order them. Uh, if no candidate receives a majority of votes, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, and the voters who voted for that candidate are then, they, we look at their second choice, okay? And so their votes are reallocated, and we continue to do this until we have somebody with a majority. Uh, Ireland, uh, Australia, even some United, Minneapolis in, in a city in the United States, um, use a variant of uh, preferential voting. The main difference between a majority system and this is that uh, here we replace uh, multiple rounds of voting with a preferential ballot, uh, which is why this system is sometimes referred to as an instant runoff election. Uh, if it doesn't, we don't have one after the first time, we strike that last one and we have that count right away again. Okay, so it's an instant runoff is kind of the, the good way to think of it. In most modern democracies, most policies are made through indirect democracy. However, there are times when people get to vote directly on legislation. Uh, many democracies allow for uh, direct democracy and referendums and initiative votes. A referendum is going to be a national vote called for by the government. Circle that. A national vote called for by the government to address a specific proposal. And it's often a change to the Constitution. An initiative is a national vote again called by the members of the public. So not the government this time. The people are going to call for this vote. And this is going to probably address a specific proposal. Okay, we're going to wrap up this chapter with civil rights and civil liberties. So first we want to differentiate between them. Civil rights are about equality. So usually this is groups. Groups have to be equal. So the civil rights movement was groups of people, right? Civil rights are groups, equality. Civil liberties are about freedom, usually individuals here. Civil rights and liberties often overlap, but not always. Uh, for instance, banning hate speech may help promote equality, but it also infringes on freedoms, right? Both rights and liberties are necessary to the functioning of a democracy, but democracies differ in the number and types of rights that they uphold. Uh, so many social democratic constitutions treat universal education, health care, um, retirement benefits, maternity, paternity leaves as human rights, while the United States, uh, are, we're a little bit more liberal in our constitution, um, we are mostly limited to uh, civil, the civil liberties within the Bill of Rights. So my friends, it's been fun. It's chapter six. We're going to sum it up real quick. Liberal democracy is based on participation, competition, and liberty. And it can be practiced directly or indirectly, mostly indirectly. Democratization is shaped by economic, political, social, and international forces. While all democracies have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, uh, they differ in how they are constructed. Parliamentary, presidential, and semi-presidential systems often uh, offer different choices on legislative executive uh, relations. All democracies require political parties to function, but the form of their party system is shaped by their electoral rules. There are many different ways to elect representatives or vote on policies, and democracies vary in terms of specific rights, liberties that they include in their constitutions. We're done, my friends. Chapter six, you got this. 20s on this quiz. I want to see, you get, we got 14 people in class. Let's see, let's have a little, 14 20s on this quiz. We can do this, my friends. Keep studying, keep hanging in there. We got a lot of A's in this class right now. Let's make them A pluses. We can do this. We're studying for that quiz, right, that test in May. A's equal threes, fours, five. So keep doing the work. I'll keep helping you along. 
We'll see you next time. Have a great night, my friends.